Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por venir y gracias a Ivan Mason, que todos conocéis, por ofrecerse amablemente a dar esta, esta charla. Ha sido de los pocos que te has, de mutu propio, has dicho, quiero darla, quiero darla. O sea que, <risa> <risa> eh, que gracias. Bueno, Ivan eh, hizo su, su doctorado en Oceanografía Física en la Universidad de, de Las Palmas de Gran Canarias sí. y luego ha hecho una serie de, de postdocs en el ICM en Barcelona. Luego tuvo un contrato HAEDOC y ahora desde el año pasado, creo, tienes un un postdoc de la, de la CAIP. O Exacto, sea que, sí. bueno, cuando quieras, muchas gracias. Ok. So, uh, I'll get started right away. I'm going to just switch off the lights. Oh. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to... Uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, the work that's been done with this uh, eddy tracking uh, code, which we've uh, called the Pi, Pi eddy tracker. Um, uh, okay, so briefly as an outline, a little bit of an introduction, just uh, giving you an idea of um, uh, the scales involved on the eddies, which we're going to be uh, tracking, which of course is the, the mesoscale eddies. Uh, a little bit then about how uh, the mechanics of the code, how it works, how it identifies the eddies in um, the region of the South Atlantic. Um, and I'm taking two different views about how to interpret the results. One from a, uh, making kind of like mean composites, which is kind of a, a Eulerian view. And then after that, we're going to follow some eddies and uh, see what happens to them along their, their, their tracks. And um, I'll summarize and end up just with um, talking a little bit about some of the algorithmic choices and the imp impacts that they, they, they might have. And also um, some of the applications that uh, this, this uh, code can be used for and some of the future work plans. So um, I imagine that all of us have uh, seen this particular figure or something similar. Um, at some point, and it's very, very useful in giving us kind of like an overview of uh, all the scales involved in the various uh, geophysical phenomena and, and features that we, we deal with. Down at the, um, the bottom end of the scale, we've got internal waves, internal motions, uh, which have spatial scales of kind of like, uh, well, uh, tens to hundreds, maybe up to a kilometer. Um, and uh, time scales of, of more or less a day or a couple of day, days or less. On the other end of the scale, of course, is uh, something like global warming and at over very large areas as well. So uh, what we're talking about, of course, is the mesoscale, which is kind of obviously more or less in the middle, at least on these logarithmic scales that we're using here. And in particular, we're looking at uh, mesoscale eddies. Um, And you can see that spatial scales are kind of like tens of kilometers up to a couple of hundred kilometers, 300 kilometers, something like that. And um, the time scales can be sort of between a month and a year, but probably a little bit more than a year in some cases as well. So for a little bit of a, a more um, uh, focused view on, um, on mesoscale eddies, I found this... Uh, Uh, a kind of uh, a book which is edited by uh, Summer Hayes and Thorpe, and there was just one that was in 1998, and there was uh, one chapter entitled "Ocean Weather Eddies in the Sea," and um, in the lower part of the figure, of course, we have um, we have this map of uh, Western Europe, and we can see that there's a, a a low pressure system. This was in January. I don't know which year it was, but there's a low pressure pressure system, atmospheric. Um, it's an atmospheric uh, cyclone, mesoscale cyclone. And, um, you know, that's about uh, a couple of thousand kilometers across. And um, it's bringing cold and, and, and wet uh, weather, um, in this case, to the, to, to the UK. And then as an inset over here, the zoom, it's magnified. I think it was uh, about 10 times or something like that. And it is a, it is a cyclone. So... Uh, the, the lighter colors are colder temperatures. It, it's a SST map. Um, and, that, and it's about 100 kilometers across. 
and we can imagine that it seems like quite an intense eddy, so we can imagine that it probably has quite a long life cycle of uh, several months or, or more or something like that. Um, so in this, in this book and in this, this chapter, um, the authors ask the rhetorical question of, well, are, are eddies um, important? And of course, they, they answer in the, in the affirmative, um, and you know, they state that, um, that eddies are uh, very effective carriers of, of heat and mass and biogeochemical um, uh, properties. Um, but they said that there's, there's a big sampling pro problem at that time. Um, and so they can't really say how important these, these effects and these transport, transports actually are. Um, today, uh, we frequently say we still have a sampling problem, but certainly uh, we're in much, we're much better position now uh, with the daily maps, global maps of sea level anomalies so that we can actually um, make a very good characterization of the eddy field, the global eddy field at any particular moment um, for a period of now more than 20 years. And, um, and we can actually track those eddies as well uh, very, very efficiently. So um, one of the ways that we can do this, that there are various codes out there for um, eddy tracking, and this one is one which has been written in Python. It's called the PyEddy Tracker. A um, little bit of the history. It was originally a MATLAB code um, which was written for uh, a paper by Pablo Sangra. Um, it was a, a code that was based on uh, using the Yakubo Weiss parameter, and um, that was applied to the region of the, the Canary Islands, where you know that many um, uh, topic topographically generated um, eddies occur and can be observed. Um, I took that code and I changed it to, to, to Python um, and I changed it as well because I wanted to apply it to a, a ROMS model solution that, that, that I had. And later I um, changed it again so that it, it would again work with uh, sea surface height rather than Okubu of Weiss and could also be applied to um, ob ob observed data such as from altimetry. Um, so I started working um, a lot on that code sometime in 2013 and at a certain point um, began to get very nice uh, comparisons with the eddy track data set from uh, Chelton et al, which from now, from now on I'll refer to, to this, this paper as CSS 11. And um, given these very, very nice comparisons, we decided it might be a good idea to, uh, to publish this code and to make it publicly uh, available. And so that's what we did. Um, and I'm going to tell you more about that, that uh, process as we go. In fact, it was published uh, last year, this paper. So um, the question then is, well, what is this? Who is this, this uh, Chelton et al? And, and what are those data? So um, Chelton et al uh, make available a um, eddy track data set. It's global. And it goes, it lasts for, I think, from 1992 to 2013 at the moment. Um, I'm showing you here the, uh, the domain that they use. Obviously, it's global, so that's what you get. And this particular figure, um, it just has two of what I think are their two tracks, which I think show the longest cyclone and anticyclone, respectively. And you have these numbers, which are the track IDs. I'm pointing this out because later on, uh, these, will, these track IDs will be uh, relevant in what I'm going to, to, to show you. Um, Chelton et al., uh, the, this data set is based on the global uh, Aviso um, seven-day data set, the, the weekly data set. There's now a new data set, which is daily, but these data which are available are on the old data set. And I'm going to do some comparisons with my results with these, with these data. So, um, how do we track eddies? First of all, we need some data, and those are, can be observational, but they can also be model data. 
And Ultimidator are, Ultimidator are particularly good. Uh, that's what the Pietti tracker uses, is what Chelton et al. and others use. But also SST can be used. But I'm not going to talk about that, and the Pietti tracker uh, code doesn't use SST at all. Um, so we have some uh, altimeter data, and we have this code, the Pietti tracker code. So the first thing that we need to do is to define some kind of a region of interest. So here I'm just showing you, um, this is from the, 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 the paper from 2014, and um, we have a um, snapshot of the sea level anomaly on August, in August in 1996. And I ran this de domain as the tracking domain, and then I defined for the paper, I defined an analysis domain, um, which is where the, the results were presented, just in that, that little box, because that's the Canary Islands over there, and that was, was um, chosen as the region of, of interest. So we see the sea, sea level anomalies. We see that the active tracks um, on this particular day, uh, you've got the, the dots which mark the uh, positions of the eddies on that particular date, and then the tracks be, be behind them. Um, there's also this other little box over here where you can see that there's a, actually a cyclonic eddy inside there. And in the following slides, I'm going to be zooming in on, on that when I describe a little bit more of the, the uh, methodology. So um, in explaining the, the, um, the methodology, I'm going to do it in two passes. First of all, I'm going to give you this uh, quick little overview. Um, and when I've done that, I will come back and concentrate on some of more of the details with... Um, um, with, well, with more detail. So what do we do? Uh, we have uh, all of these fields of the sea level anomalies um, at different weekly or daily intervals. And we want to filter these fields so that we just have the, the mesoscale. We're not interested in, in any other scales. It's just the eddies that we want to, 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 to have. Then we contour these data. And that simply means applying a, a contour uh, function like you have in MATLAB to the data. And then we have all of these, these successive contours at all of these different levels uh, because um, the range is probably between um, minus 50 and 50 centimeters. And we just iterate at intervals of, let's say, one, one centimeter. And each time we're going to be uh, searching these contours. So... Um, what we want to do once we've done the contours is we want to identify all the eddies at let's say time k. So that's one particular snapshot. And then we proceed to the next snapshot, which in this case will be seven days later, time k plus one. And at k plus one, again, we filter contour and identify all the eddies. Once we've done that, we have k, k plus one, and we want to track the eddies from k to k plus 1. Um, and finally, uh, those eddies that don't get tracked are either going to correspond to uh, new eddies, eddy births, or eddies which have, uh, have died. And so we have to deal with those in some, in some way as well. So in this uh, procedure, there are two main things which are happening. First is eddy identification which is down to here, more or less. And then there's the tracking down at the end. So let's go and have a look now at the eddy identification. So in the figure, um, I'm showing the zoom now into that uh, cyclone that I showed you a couple of slides back. And um, the, uh, the colors are now not showing the sea level anomaly, but they're showing the magnitude of the, the geostrophic velocity calculated from that sea level anomaly field. Okay? And the scale is in centimeters per second. So um, we're now doing this, uh, we're iterating over these, uh, these contours. Uh, it's a cyclone, so we start at the top and we're going to uh, iterate down and we're going to sample each contour. 
So in this case, uh, let's say we've come to this contour, which is the one in the red, and we want to know if this could be an eddy or not. So the first thing we have to ask, well, is the contour closed? If it's not closed, it obviously can't be an eddy. So in this case, yes, it's closed. So that means we can uh, proceed to the next test. It's passed that first test in that it's closed. So the next thing is to do a count of all the pixels inside that, that contour. And we, can, uh, we impose some limits um, about how many, con how many pixels there should be inside. And the minimum is going to be eight, and the maximum is going to be uh, 1,000. So we don't want to get, go below eight pixels, and we don't want to go above uh, 1,000. Um, in this case, we pass this particular eddy, so, uh, or this particular contour. Next one, there's a, a shape error, and that's just some kind of um, a test to see how deformed the, the contour is. Um, th I have kind of a semi-arbitrary value of 55%, which I use. Um, the smaller the value, the, more, the closer uh, it is to a circle. And this is one, one area which I'm not really convinced is actually useful in the whole um, uh, eddy identification procedure. But still, that's, that's in there for, for, for the moment. Uh, the next test is about the amplitude of the eddy. And the amplitude is defined as the difference in height between the contour and the uh, maximum or minimum uh, pixel within the contour. If it's, a, um, um, if it's a, a cyclone, then it's going to be a, a minimum. And um, this is the range that, uh, that I have been using, although more recently I've been changing the, the lower value for the amplitude uh, to, be, to just be zero, in fact. Uh, but these are the, the, the values, for example, that Chelton et al. use, is one and 150 centimeters. So we assume that, again, we pass this particular test for the amplitude. And the last test is about uh, how many local maxima or minima are inside the contour, whether it be uh, maxima uh, for an anticyclone or minima for a, a cyclone. Um, in the, ed the, ed the Pieti tracker code, there can only be one. In Chelten et al.'s code, they permit uh, multiple um, local maximal minima inside, and later on I'm going to show you the impacts uh, of the, those particular of that particular choice. So once we've done all of this procedure, we now have the red contour, and we're going to call that the effective contour or CF. And we can then uh, look for uh, the centroid of that of that circle which corresponds to this point, which we will call coordinate PF. And then we can also make a, a circle which um, has the same area as the contour. Um, and the radius of that circle then becomes the, what's called the effective radius or LF. Okay, so once we've done that, uh, we're not finished yet. We need to uh, then move on to the speed-based speed contour. Before we were looking at the effective contour, now we need to go to the speed-based contour. So what is that? How do we find that? Basically, we now start iterating inwards over contours, starting from our effective contour, the one in red. So these gray contours are all of the inner uh, contours. And we're going to iterate from this one to each one. And with each, each iteration, we calculate the average of the geostrophic speed lying along that, that contour, and we'll call that UG, okay? Um, and as we keep on going in, we also make a um, calculation of the pixel count, i.e. how many pixels are contained within each of the contours as we go in. And this tells us when to stop, because we still have that uh, I min, value, which was 8, and we stop when we get to, uh, to, to 8 pixels, and this is the black contour that you can see over there. Okay, so uh, the speed-based contour then 
is the contour of all of the gray ones that corresponds to the maximum UG. And that turns out to be the one in green over here. And from that, we can get uh, a coordinate uh, P speed, which is, of course, is again the, uh, the centroid of the green contour. And from that, we can get that circle, and then we can get that speed based radius. And it's the speed based radius, which is the one um, that uh, the eddy tracker code is going to, going to save. And that's going to be considered the radius of, of, of the eddy. Um, one final detail is then we have the question is, uh, we've got three, three different coordinates over there. And which one is going to con correspond to uh, the, the center of the eddy? And what, again, we want to save that because we want to have that information for any processing that we do afterwards with our data. So, uh, Jelton et al. use uh, PF, the red one, for their tracking. And um, in the Pi-Eddy tracker, we use uh, P-Track, which is the, the black one over there. And you can see that uh, depending on the shape of the eddy, you could actually have quite, quite some distance between these contours. In fact, between the, the green and the black, you can also sometimes get some, some, some differences in, uh, in that position. And we're going to see that there can be some impacts of these choices as well later on. So um, we are now done with the ED identification. Yeah. Uh, the P track? Well, what's the definition of P track? Sorry, yes. It's the centroid of the inner black contour over there. Okay, um, I'm not going to go into quite so much detail about the eddy tracking uh, part, but suffice to say what we do, we have a whole um, matrix of uh, lats, lats and longs at time k and another one at time k plus one, and we have to kind of join them up in a, in a sensible way. Um, so what we do is just make this uh, distance matrix and then we iterate over that matrix. Um, and essentially, we find the, the nearest points to, to our eddy within a defined, uh, in this case, it's uh, an, an ellipse. And um, if uh, two pairs of coordinates are, are, well, if from one P track, um, we have the ellipse around it. And if we have a P track K plus one, and it lies within the ellipse, then we can consider uh, that there's, there's a match. Um, but if there is, um, okay. So if um, there are no eddies in range, then that track is terminated and it's counted as an, as an eddy death. Um, at the end of this, iteration process so that now at between k and k plus one we've looked at every single possible combination we're going to have some leftovers um, or unassigned p track k or k plus one eddies um, those are going to be new eddies eddy births and that that's essentially how uh, how it, how it works okay so um, does all of this work um, fortunately, it does most of the time, um, but now I want to, 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 to show you uh, a little bit about, um, well, from some examples. Um, so as I said, the, the, I used the Pi-Eddy tracker code in the, the South Atlantic, and um, comparing with, with uh, data um, from Chelton et al., and the, the sea level anomaly data from um, Aviso, are the, it's exactly the same data which are being, being used from, from the two. And I got a series of um, maps and of, of average map, mean maps, long-term maps, and histograms, which I will show you. And then we will have a look um, a little bit more, uh, which, which talk about eddy density, eddy lifetimes, and some, some statistics from the radi radii and the, and the amplitudes. Um, so, uh, this is the domain, 
uh, the South Atlantic domain. This is the annual mean EKE. And you can see that uh, there's actually quite a lot going on uh, in this, this region because we've got uh, over on the eastern side the Agulhas current and its retroflexion. And uh, this is a well-known region also. It's the generation um, area for these Ag Agulhas anticyclones, which propagate uh, the, some of the longest lived, lived eddies uh, in, the, in the global ocean. And they, they carry... Uh, um, warm water from the Indian Ocean, and it pro propagates across the, um, the, the, the South Atlantic. You can see the, the signature from them extending all the way across. And then on the other side, you have the Brazil Mal Malvinas Confluence, which is uh, the meeting of two um, water masses from the, from the south and from the north with, with very uh, different properties. And so you get this very uh, complex uh, circulation and very energetic region as well on, on this side. So, um, straight into the results. So, in these, uh, these composite maps, because um, there's, there's several of them which I'm going to show you, so the, the format will be Piety Tracker results on the left-hand side and Chelton et al. results on the right-hand side. And we've got, uh, what we're showing is the mean numbers of, ed of eddies per square degree uh, per year. And first of all, we're looking at anticyclones, and then at cyclones, and then finally, it's the polarity. So it's the ratio between cyclones and, and anticyclones. Um, I think that qualitatively, you can, should be able to all see that uh, there's actually a very, very good agreement between the, between the, the, the two data sets. Um, in particular, you can see, again, the, the impact of these um, Agulhas current rings in both data sets. Um, the patterns, yeah, and the, for the polarity, the patterns are quite similar as well with regions, regions of dominance of uh, anticyclones and of, 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 of cyclones. Um, I'm not going to say too much more about that, but if there's questions, certainly uh, I can ask. So uh, here we've got similar, it's a similar idea, but now we're looking at... Um, eddy births and deaths. So in the top two panels, this is eddy births. And in the bottom two panels, it's uh, eddy deaths. So over here, straight away, you can see that it seems that in the Pi-Eddy tracker, uh, there are higher concentrations of both eddy births in compare with the Chelton data and with deaths as well. Um, so... Uh, I'm going to, we're going to talk more about that uh, in, 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 a little, in a little while and about why this might be. Um, offhand, it's difficult to say if one is, which one is more correct than, than, than the other. Um, but it does prompt us to, it's, it would be interesting to, to try to quantify this a little bit more and see what's happening. So in the next slide, uh, I'm just showing a, a histogram of um, eddy longevity. So uh, on the x-axis, this is uh, eddy lifetimes, which is in weeks, and number of eddies, eddies per year. So the pi-eddy tracker are the, uh, uh, the blue and the red, and uh, the Chelton et al. data are kind of in this light blue and this orangey sort, sort of color. So what you can see uh, is looking at about kind of with eddies of lifetime about... Uh, 40 weeks or less, um, certainly the Pi-Eddy tracker is counting many, many more such, such eddies. But then at uh, longer lifetimes, uh, there's a shift and the Chelton et al. data are sh starting to show much longer lifetimes. Clearly that's consistent what we, with, what we, with, with the maps that we saw in the, in the last figure because uh, uh, Chelton et al. is not recording so many eddy births or deaths. So those eddies must be living longer. Um, for the anticyclones, uh, it's, there's a reasonable agreement because you know we're only talking kind of um, ten or so eddies from about about this point onwards. These are very long-lived eddies. That's a couple of years, you know, almost three years. Um, 
but for the cyclones it's curious because it just stops over there in fact you can't see it but there is one cyclone that appears just over there but that's all there is in the in the bottom panel that's just showing the ratio between cyclones and anticyclones and we can see that while we actually have some a reasonable amount of data up in this period there's pretty good agreement but obviously after that uh, we can't really say very much so um, that's eddy lifetimes um, what about eddy, eddy radii again same same pattern now in the figure uh, these are the uh, pi eddy tracker data these are, are cheltons uh, there's a big difference over here okay the pi eddy track tracker is predicting many 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 uh, more uh, eddies with smaller radius and Chelton has got many more eddies with a larger radius for the uh, uh, um, polarity the ratio between the two of them there's pretty good agreement what about amplitude okay well this is this looks pretty good uh, for the amplitude the 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 amplitudes is very good agreement uh, in the magnitudes and on the polarity as well so the uh, amplitudes seem to be okay but now we've just looked at the radius and the amplitudes let's go back and have a look at the maps for for these so first of all for the radii in the top panels again cyclones anticyclones and okay uh, this is confirmed what we saw in the previous couple of figures the Chelton data definitely have uh, larger radii than the Pi Eddy tracker data do. For the amplitudes, um, it seems pretty much perfect. So, um, in general, uh, I think that uh, there's very good agreement between the, the two dat data sets, uh, but there are some discrepancies, in particular with the lifetimes and with the radii, the magnitudes of, of the radii. So um, then the question is, is, can we learn anything about what's happening, uh, what, what, what the differences are between the two codes by going and taking a, a different approach and having a, having a look at some individual uh, tracks? So we can do that. Um, and first of all, I'm going to show you uh, a good number of slides following an anticyclone. And I would characterize this as, this as having a... Um, generally good agreement between um, the, two, uh, the, two, the two data sets. So this particular eddy is one which in the Chelton et al. data set uh, has this code, um, and that's the one we're going to, to, to follow. Okay, so um, there's quite a lot of information on this series of figures, which I'm going to show. Uh, so I'm just going to guide you through it a little bit. Um, the Chelton eddy is marked by this color, and the Chelton eddy is always going to be right in the center of the figure. The Pi eddy tracker has this color, and at, when, they're track, when, the, when the two are in close agreement, then they're both going to be there in the center. But at times, the Pi eddy tracker is going to seem to move away, and that's because there's some distance between them in terms of identifying the, co the coordinates of the two eddies. So you will see that there's, um, corresponding to the colors, we have uh, a circle, and uh, that's an indication of the radius according to whichever uh, code we're using. So sometimes you'll see that radius increase and decrease. We also have an arrow pointing upwards that corresponds to the, uh, the amplitude of the eddy. And then we also have this arrow, and that's an indication of the um, rotational speed of, of the eddy. Um, it has these two arrow, arrows over here, which will not change, and that's to give you an idea of the actual magnitude that, that you've got. Okay. Um, here you've got a whole bunch of numbers. Uh, the ones at the top correspond to uh, some... Um, uh, some properties of the... Uh, of, of Chelton's data, for example, you have a track number, uh, and that shouldn't change the whole the whole time because we're just looking at this one particular track. You have then the count, like observation one, two, three, four. 
Julian day plus actually the date. Cyclone, psych, psych is just an indicate, is plus or minus if it's an anticyclone or a, um, a cyclone. In this case, we know it's an anticyclone, so you don't need to worry about that. The positions, amplitude, radius, and uh, U is, is the, um, uh, the rotational speed. I don't actually know what track modified is. Um, down below, it's the same information, but now this time from the Pi-80 tracker. Finally, down here, uh, this can be quite interesting. So uh, on, this, uh, on the, on the y-axis, we're actually looking at um, uh, the distance from observation K to observation K1. For, and the, the two colors, again, correspond to the different uh, tracks. So particularly when there's peaks, as you see here and here, that's indicating that from um, you know, week one to week two, uh, the eddy really traveled a long time. And we have to ask ourselves sometimes whether that's valid or, or not. Um, and then there's a, in green, this line is going to move as I iterate through, through the track. Um, and so the, you'll see where exactly we are. I don't know why the, what these, well, obviously this is time, but I don't know exactly what these numbers correspond to, but you don't need to worry about that. The last bit of information is all of this stuff over here is um, what's coming in the future, because this eddy is going to start uh, tracking westwards. And so you can get a little bit of an idea of how some of these the radius, etc., is going to change as we move forward. Okay, so let's go. Um, so as I track forward, you can see this thing moving, and it'll be interesting when we get to some of these points. Okay, that one actually wasn't so interesting. It seemed to all behave quite well, uh, although there was... A little bit of a jump there, a difference between, which possibly is what caused that peak. So let's go forward to the next one. Okay, and so there's a little bit of a jump there. As I said, this, is, this, this, this one is mostly a good one. Um, but something happened here. So for Chelton et al., the radius has suddenly increased a lot, whereas the Pieti tracker hasn't. Also, you can see that the centroid doesn't really seem to correspond to what we can see as this, the, what, the center of the, of the eddy. So why is that? So if you remember before, I talked about the, uh, the number of uh, local minima or maxima with inside some contour. And I said that the Pi-80 tracker only permits one, whereas Chelton's code permits many more. So what's happened here is that there's another maxima over here, and Chelton's code has um, permitted that. So as a result, that became the contour that it was selected. And then when it looked for the centroid and he used, they used the, uh, the effective contour centroid as their tracking centroid, that's why they've ended up with the position being over there. Okay. So same thing has happened again. Same again. Same again. Okay, now it's more or less stabilizing a little bit. And then we carry on and we go through and we might come to another one. Yep, okay, so we've got this. So again, you know, there's a big, big discrepancy in the, in the radius over there. Same thing again, same thing again, same thing again. Okay, now there's some better agreement. Keep going. Yeah, yeah. And now we're coming to the end of the lifetime of the eddy. Okay, so that one was, I mean, that was a long, that was a long track. It was, uh, it was over a year, and the, the two codes worked pretty well together. Uh, this is another one, and um, again, it's an anticyclone. And here there's going to be some more, more serious differences. So... Um, First of all, just to explain what's going on over here is that uh, this particular code 
for, for making these figures isn't very good at dealing with uh, crosses in the zero de degree mer meridian. So we're right at, um, uh, at the zero degree mer meridian, so we're just missing the sea level anom anomaly data over there. But it doesn't matter, we'll just keep going. And that happens because the eddy goes backwards a little bit. But again, there's nothing interesting there, although you can see that there's quite big differences between the positions. But anyway, let's keep going. And uh, okay, so they're doing well together. All right, something happened there. Okay, same thing now is that uh, I guess that with the Chelton code, you've got a local maxima here, another one here, and somehow it's selected that. But I don't know why the radius came out so small. Okay, this is good, this is good. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Okay. Okay, again, 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 again. Even there, there's something, something going on. Uh, again, again, see it's catching something over here and possibly something over here as well. And okay, so at that, at that point, the Piety tracker stopped tracking for some reason. No, no, it's still going, sorry, okay. Same thing again. I'm going backwards. I'm getting confused. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, see, seeing these things um, with the local maximum minima, it, it points to, and, and then we think about the, the composite maps of the eddy radii, and we saw that there was very consistent difference in the, the magnitudes of the eddies. This obviously, the, the, these effects are meaning in the, that in the Chelton code, you're getting these really big radii, which you're not getting, the, getting, getting in the Piety tracker code. Uh, maybe you might consider that, that this is more correct than that. Um, I don't know. Uh, to me, I, I kind of prefer to, to really just concentrate on the core of, of, of the one, one eddy. There's some subjectivity in that. Um, and I should point out that this is not cherry picked in any way. This you can, I've looked at many, many uh, of these, these, these tracks and this kind of behavior is, is very, very consistent in, in, in the Chelton uh, data, data sets. So um, getting now towards a kind of like a summary and coming to the end of the talk. Um, in the Piedi tracker code, we've observed smaller eddy radii and me, more frequent uh, eddy births and, and deaths. And the contrary in the, in the, in the uh, Chelton et al. data. Algorithmic differences, I've kind of already alluded to that, but certainly these last snapshots have shown that very clearly that the algorithmic differences just with the, that number of local minima or maxima has a strong impact. And um, it can be you know, stated that de definitely the Pi ID tracker has a much stricter identif eddy identification rules than the, 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 uh, the, the Chelton's code. Um, and the expected consequences from that would be what we saw, less, lo less large eddies and more track uh, terminations. And you know, a general statement is that the eddy identification is, is quite a delicate uh, balance. So, um, what are the what what kind of applications um, are there for a pi for a, uh, an eddy tracker code such as the pi eddy tracker? So it's an extremely powerful tool actually, especially when in, used in conjunction with other um, data sets. For example, uh, something which I'm just starting to work on at the moment is um, using it with um, remotely sensed chlorophyll data as part of the the um, emotion project. Uh, and that's an idea of uh, having the eddy tracks and then uh, using those, those tracks to identify in the other data set, the, um, uh, the maps of, of, of um, sea surface chlorophyll, and 
take those data and then make some kind of a composite out of that and to try, try to uh, g characterize the, uh, the impact of the eddy, perhaps on, on the, uh, the chlorophyll distributions. Similarly, this has been done by, um, for sea surface salinity by Marta uh, Umbert in, um, in Barcelona in a paper. And what they did was to uh, use the Paedi tracker um, to track um, um, uh, Gulf Stream eddies and, um, and then also uh, then get the signature, uh, the associated signature with, the, with salinity, sea surface salinity from the Aquarius satellites. Um, and then another, another area of interest, of course, is using Argo or other synthetic data products, and that can give you a, um, a 3D view. Um, and also, uh, that should be sea level. And another thing which was done by um, Arthur Capet uh, in a paper last year is uh, to use the Eddy tracker as a diagnostic tool. So when a new uh, sea level anomaly uh, product uh, comes out, uh, you can apply it to the old product and the new product, and it's a way to, to get an idea of, um, of, of the impact of the improvements done, I mean, in this case, by the people at, uh, at CLS, the improvements that, that they've made to, to, to their, their, their product. Concretely, that was looking at the, the old weekly data, DT10, versus the, the new daily data, the DT, DT14. So there are a variety of different applications that... Uh, um, for which the, these codes can be used. Um, of course, one of the questions is, what about the global data set from the PyEDI tracker? Um, it's not ready at the moment. It's still too slow. Um, but it is something which I, uh, I would like to do, and I'm fairly confident that um, hopefully in the next month, few months or, or more, I'm not sure exactly, but it will be possible to do um, a... a a well, it, it is possible, but it's just very slow. It takes too, too long. Um, this was done um, at, at CLS in, in Toulouse, and it's just about four years, uh, but they used a, um, a cluster with, uh, so it was kind of paralle parallelized uh, approach. But I, would, I, I think it can be done just on a standard, standard desktop. Okay, so finally, the PyEDI tracker, it's an easy to use tool for eddy tracking. It can be applied to the Mediterranean Sea. It works with uh, the Aviso uh, Mediterranean uh, product. There's very good agreement with the Chelten et al. data set, which is uh, arguably still the reference uh, data set for Editrax. Uh, it works with the, the new daily DT14 um, release from Aviso. Uh, the code is available at my uh, Imedea um, website, you can get it, or consult the paper, or just come and speak to me. And as for the future, as I said, uh, it, the performance, the, the speed needs to be improved. So that's, that's all. Thank you. And any questions? Thanks very much, Ivan, for a very interesting talk. Any question? Yeah. Um, uh, so I have what what uh, what was the wavelength of the filter, and why do you do that? Because you already have um, a limit on the size of the eddy, given by your limits of uh, I max in the number of uh, pixels inside the eddy. So have you tried not uh, uh, filtering and if there is a uh, real difference? Um, the, the, the reason to do it is um, because, as I understand, in the sea level anomaly fields, there is still some kind of a, a large scale signature so that if you look at uh, zonally across one of the basins, you might, you might see something like that. So if you filter that out and the wavelength was like, uh, I think it was 20 in the zonal and 10, 20 degrees in the zonal and 10 meridionally, uh, which is what Charlton does. I took those, those, those scales from, from the paper. 
then instead of having this, like each bump corresponding to an eddy, then you have something which is flat with just the bumps of, of, of the eddy. Uh, that's the reason that, that, that I do it. Okay. And, but I've never, I'm, I, I've never, yeah, I've never um, explicitly compared the two. Would there be a big difference in the results? Actually, probably not. I don't well, know. It's just, that's why uh, mm. I was maybe it was not so long. Yeah. Um, At that time, I was probably just using Chelton's paper as kind of like the recipe yeah. to, to, to do it. OK, uh, about the radi radi radii. Radii. <laughs> radii. Um, you, you, you you showed the difference between your method, your code and uh, Shelton. Uh, is the definition at the U is maximum? Yes. U is maximum. Yes. So you cannot, uh, it's, it's cannot explain by that. Okay. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, do you have an, the, the explanation for the difference in lifetimes comes from, you think from the <coughs> fact that your method is more um, uh, strict. strict than um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, but at the same time, um, I know that there are times in my code where eddies just stop for no reason. And that's one of my list of things that I have to look at. One, there's sometimes when a perfectly formed eddy is propagating and for some reason it just doesn't get detected. So... Um, <coughs> So that's that from my part, that's something that I have to fix. But on the other part, I also know um, I haven't been able, I haven't showed any figures like that, but at CLS, when we were looking at these, these kind of Lagrangian views, there are times when um, uh, Chelton's eddies jump hundreds of kilometers, particularly when you go closer to the, the, the equator. Um, and how, how much that's happening at other latitudes, I don't know exactly. Um, but it seems to me that the, the tracking is, is much more, more liberal and uh, there's a... Okay, and related question. The, the number of eddies, sorry, <laughs> I have a lot of questions. <laughs> it's my <Sorry. laughs> things that I'm interested in. The, um, the no total number of eddies detected is, uh, is, is much higher in Shelton or in US method without the tracking. I mean, <coughs> if we don't look at uh, indiv uh, the... The tracking, but just the number identification. of the identification of any. Do you identify less, much less, or than Shelton, or it's more or less the same? Because you say that you your method was more uh, strict. So does it have an impact on the identification of the eddies? Um, I I don't know actually. I don't know which one would have more. Um, in part, it might be that mine has more because. If there's a large eddy with different local maximas, Chelton's might identify all of that as one. Whereas in my code, it might be identified like three different eddies or something like that. Um, but, but I don't know the answer though. I don't know which is okay. which. Is Thank which. you. Okay. That also at CLS they are testing. They are comparing both your code and then the new code that developed by, by Chelton. So if you could make a comment or make a few... Uh, explanation of the new code, if you know how it works. And then the second comment is about that, you know, that Roman did his PhD comparing three different methods. One was Shelton, and then Chirley, and then Halo. Uh, and so, well, there are different codes nowadays, and so how do you compare all this? How do you suggest that we should work with different codes and so on? So the first thing is the new code by Shelton. Okay, uh, so yes. Um, we we aren't going to see any more um, updates to the uh, the Chelton data set which I've been using here because he has changed the methodology. I, I don't actually know very much about the code, but I know that um, instead of working from contours, identifying contours, came from the contour and then working inwards, now you start with some kind of point, some kind of singularity, and then they somehow work outwards, what he calls growing the eddy, to try to find the properties like the radius and the, the amplitude. And um, I, I don't know anything more. I, I imagine it's an improvement, otherwise they wouldn't have uh, 
uh, be promoting it. Um, but I don't know anything more more about it. I'm, I'm looking forward to to to, to hearing hearing more uh, about it. Um, but there's also uh, there's a couple of other data sets. There's another one actually from Danny, who's sitting at uh, behind us, who has a, a draft of a paper which um, sounds like it's an approach. It's similar in some respects, in growing outwards to get some some kind of characteristics of the eddy. And there's another paper that was pub published um, in Nature, Nature Reports or something, Scientific Reports, um, by some people, I think, from, uh, from MIT. And they've, done, uh, they've produced a, a global uh, eddy data set which they've made available. Um, but I've been told that it's all in ASCII. It's all uh, a text file, all of the data. And so for processing, it's, it's just horrible. That's what I've heard. Um, okay, and so the second question was about different, different, run, different. Okay, um, I think that all of these these eddy trackers uh, provide useful results, and um, they probably all have strengths and weaknesses in one way or another. I don't know that one is necessarily some kind of a study directly with the the objective to to, to compare the different codes. Uh, could be something interesting uh, to do by somebody in the future. Uh, well, in a sense, that's what you did, but with kind of like your limited, limited uh, domain. I'm not really interested in the comparison between the methods. Uh, yeah. Really showing which one was good, no, not, not really the, the focus. The objective. Yeah. I, I do think it would be an interesting thing to do, but uh, again, I'm not really sure if I, if I want to do it either. I don't know. Yes. So, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Danny? Any more questions? A ver, entiendo que que tu limitación de que no haya más de un máximo dentro de un contorno para considerarlo eddy es para evitar contornos que en realidad están con contornos que contienen un solo eddy con un pequeño mínimo local. Yeah. Um, yes, that uh, that does happen, and there is a little thing, little if statement in my code that if it finds a second local minima, but if it's really small, and I don't remember exactly how I judge what would be really or small or not, then it will ignore it. Um, and as I remember when I did tests afterwards, I think I, I did start to get some uh, longer lifetimes uh, in the eddies. Y bueno, otra cuestión. Cuando estabas comparando uh, un caso en concreto de un eddy tuyo con el de, con el de Shelton, uh, yo como esta semana estaba comparando eddies tuyos con los de Shelton y con los míos y tal, uh, claro, pasa una cosa que ahí parecía razonable asumir el tuyo como correcto, ¿no? Pero porque en el background estaban tus datos. Con Directly from the, the uh, Aviso Net CDF sí, files. Sí, pero, uh, por ejemplo, Shelton los filtra de una manera, uh, los datos, ¿no? Yo los filtro de otro mm -hmm. y no sé, si, tú me imagino que, que aplicas tu propio filtro. Entonces, me da la sensación que es difícil comparar las cosas porque al final eh, yo me he dado cuenta, el, el filtrado de datos afecta bastante a, a los resultados, ¿no? Yo, por ejemplo, uh, cambiando el radio de, de filtrado, uh, pues uh, tenía tres casos distintos y en cada caso, pues, mm, uh, pues cambiaba el, las detecciones en muchos sentidos, ¿no? Entonces, me da la sensación que hay tantas cosas que, que forman el, el edit detection global que, por ejemplo, uh, a veces comparas las bases de datos de edis finales, ¿no? Pero para comparar sería mucho más útil comparar productos intermedios. Por ejemplo, las espirales. Las espirales antes del tracking, ¿no? What do you mean the spirals? Espira uh, edis encontrados huh. que, a, que a lo mejor luego no están en la base de datos. Por... Yeah, um, okay, well, so two things. One is about the filtering. Um, we should all be more or less doing the same the same thing when we do the filtering, because if, if we're not, if we are, then we're creating something different from what the signal is. So um, 
I, I essentially copied what uh, Dudley Chelton does for his filtering, but I don't exactly have his code, which is all written in Fortran, but in Python I did something which uh, um, I think is the same. And um, at least in a qualitative sense, by looking at his figures and comparing what I get, um, I, I, I think it's very, very close. Um, and I would imagine that you're doing something sensible as, as, as well. But if, if, if not, if we're all doing different things and we're getting different results as a result of our filtering, then one of us or all of us are doing something very wrong, I think. So I don't know that that's really, that shouldn't be a factor, I don't think. Um, We had to decide to to publish your code and then also mm. to make it publicly because the mm. children's code was not available for everybody and mm. that's mm. because if, if it's in Fortran or in Python, it's not. The no, it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't. be a problem. It, it's yeah. just the fact that it's not available. So yeah, yeah. But I in mentioning the Fort the the well, yeah. I mean. It's in Fortran, but yes, you're right that the fact that it's not available, that means that I actually have no way to find out exactly what they, what they do when they do their, their filtering. All I could do was read the paper and take the, the, the scales that they were using and, 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 and that was all. Um. More questions? No? Okay, so thank okay. you very much. Thank you.